Good morning. Um, today we're going to talk about, are you a friend of God? And this is something that he's really put on my heart. So I have my laptop here. So if I keep diverting my eyes, it's because I'm wanting to stay on course, stay on focus. So the thing is, is are you a friend of God? And the first scripture we're going to look at is James 4.4. 4, and it says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So when you look up the word enemy here, it's in the Strong's Concordance, it's G2189. So it's the Greek word, eschkithra. And I probably butchered that, but whatever. Which means hostility, opposition, and hatred. Wow. To me, it says it all. We cannot be a friend of the world and be a friend of God. All who are friends of the world are God's enemies. They're hostile towards Him. They have hatred. They're opposition. So, what is your relationship with God if you have a friendship with the world? So, let's think about that. What did it just say? It said that if you had a friendship with the world, you are what? The enemy of God. Okay? What does God call a person who has a friendship with the world? Let's look at it. He says that they are ye adulterers and adulteresses. So he says that because he was supposed to be your first love, if you have a friendship with the world, you are committing adultery against him because you went off with some something else that's not part of the covenant that you made with him. Let's move on down. Our biggest problem with becoming friends of the world is that we don't seem to realize that we've become friends of the world. Did y'all hear that? One of the biggest problems with being friends with the world is the average person doesn't even realize that they're friends with the world. We rely on our own stinking thinking and justify doing what everyone else is doing. God's Word tells us that to use our own way of thinking, so to use old carnal man way of thinking, is death and hatred towards God. So let's look at that scripture. Romans 8, 6-8 says, For to be carnally minded, that means natural man thinking, old man thinking, so to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Amen. So to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity, we just looked up that word, against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Enmity here again, same word that we looked at before. But let's look at spiritually minded. Because the spiritual part of it is G4151, which means pneuma. It's the third person of the triune God. So it's actually talking about the Holy Spirit. Because the spiritually minded is allowing the Holy Spirit to be in charge of the way that we're thinking. So the third person of the triune God, the Holy Spirit, co-equal and co-eternal with the Father and the Son, a life-giving spirit. And then the um, minded part of it is G5427, which is phronema. And it is what one has in mind in the thoughts and purposes. So the thoughts and purposes of how we're thinking and wanting to do things is completely directed by the Holy Spirit. We've given over our thoughts. So the thoughts and purposes of the triune God, the Holy Spirit, living, life-giving spirit is what is our thought processes if we are spiritually minded. So, what is the result of thinking like the old man with the carnal mind? God's Word just said it was death. Okay? What kind of relationship does the carnal mind have with God? Enmity. Okay? It's completely opposed. It's against. It has nothing to do with God. It's, it's completely opposed. Okay. 
We so often fall into the lies of Satan because he does not approach us as something evil and scary. Now, we might see at Halloween time, he comes as an angel of light. And so do his ministers, okay? They come as um, ministers of righteousness. Let's look at that scripture. 1 Corinthians 11, 14 through 15 says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers are also are transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. What does Satan look like? An angel of light. That doesn't look scary. That like draws you in. Okay? If you are walking in the Spirit, do you think it would be easy to recognize Satan in his tricks? Yes, it would be a whole lot more easy. But what if you're walking in the flesh? You're using your stinking thinking and allowing the carnal mind and old man to have rule. Do you think you're going to um, be able to pick out those ministers of righteousness that are false? Or the angel that comes as light, which is really Satan. So we really have to walk in the spirit. We can't have a friendship with the world. What do Satan workers look like? They look like ministers of righteousness, right? That's what the word just said. What is the end of these evil workers? Well, God's word says that they're going to be thrown into um, the lake of fire. So, I don't, I don't want to be part of that group. Right? Let's continue on. We must stand firm on the Word of God and not be swayed back and forth. Not be swayed to look at this or participate in that because someone in church, even the minister, says it's okay. If someone in church or the minister says it's okay to do something and you know it's against God's Word, don't do it. Because they're deceived and they're being used and manipulated by the devil and they don't even know it. If God's word is against it, it's not okay. No matter how it is represented, no matter how it's presented, do not be deceived. Do not let the wolf in sheep's clothing trick you to compromising and accepting what is not of God. Scripture says, And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. And the time draw near. Go ye not therefore after them. Luke 21, 8. Deceived here is G4105, which is play a no. No, it's plano. It means to go astray, seduce, wander, be out of the way, led away from the truth, led into error, led away into error and sin, roam from safety, truth, or virtue. So, if you allow yourself to be deceived, what will Satan do? He'll draw you away. And what does he come here to do? He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But God came that you would have life and have it more in abundance. So don't let him deceive you. And lead you astray because his purpose in life is to kill, steal, and destroy you. Okay? Physically, mentally, emotionally, um, spiritually, financially. You just put in other things there. That's what he's come here to do. Because he wants to destroy you. Another scripture. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly, they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Now we're going to pause right here. You hear so many people say, judge not least you be judged. But most of the time we're taking that out of the context. Because God's word tells us over and over again to judge. It doesn't mean to be judgmental. But it means to evaluate the situation and to evaluate people. The scripture is a perfect example. You shall know them by their fruits. Okay? Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistle? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth 
every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Okay, here, let's go back to the top of it where it says that inwardly they're ravening wolves. So I looked up ravening, ravening so that way we could get an idea of what they're meaning here in context, which is G727, which is harpax. Okay, it's ravenous, extortioner, a robber. So what did he come to do? Kill, steal, and destroy. Then I looked up corrupt, which is G4550, which is sapros, which means rotten, putrefied, corrupted by one, and no longer fit for use. Okay? It's no longer fit to be used. Worthless. Literally and morally worthless. And hewn down, G1581, which is echo... Wait a second. Let me see. Ekkotto, which means to cut off, hewn, cut down, and cut out. Okay, so what happens to every tree that does not have good fruit? It gets hewn down, cut down, cut out. And then what happens to it? It's thrown into the fire. What kind of fruit does a corrupt tree have? It has evil fruit. Okay? So you'll know them by the fruits they're bearing. Now, what are good and bad fruit trees a metaphor in here? What is this talking about? Is it talking about an actual tree? He said, no, you're right. It's talking about people. And, and he is giving a scenario comparing people to trees. And so... Why do you think God wants us to be able to distinguish between those that have good fruit and those that have bad fruit or evil fruit? If he said so, we'll know who we can have fellowship with and relationship or who we need to pray for. All those are right on. Because these that are having bad fruit, could they become good fruit bearers only if they become a new tree? And that's where salvation comes into play and repentance and rejecting the old life and putting off the old man and putting on the new man. Also, God's Word tells us that those that we hang out with or keep company with, we become like them. So it's to help us to distinguish who we can minister to and who we can and cannot have friendship with. Okay? What is the casting in the fire for the bad tree and the evil fruit symbolic of? He said, hell, you're right. Because that's exactly the way I read it. Um, and let's continue on. We must stand firm on truth. Reject stinking thinking and put on the mind of Christ. And not conform to this world. God's word says, and be ye transformed. I'm sorry. Let me start back over. And God's word says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, 2. So here conformed is G4964, which is cis -m which means to conform oneself to another's pattern or fashion to fashion yourself to be just alike. And then here transformed is G3339, which is metaphor foe. And yes, that's where we get the word metaphor, metamorphosis from. To transfigure, transform, to change, to change into another form. Christ's appearance was changed and a resplend was resplendent with divine brightness on the Mount of Transfiguration. Is also what it's telling you this means. It also means literally or figuratively metamorphosis. Change, transfigure, transform, reproduce the same image. So we're supposed to be reproducing the same image of Christ, growing up into the likeness of Him. Renewing is G342, which is anagnosis, which means 
a renewal, restoration, complete change for the better, affected by the Holy Spirit. There is only one will of God. So, if any of you, you know, pause for a minute and did that thing where some people talk about, oh, well, there's a perfect will of God and a permissive will of God. And I'm going to say that's junk. All right? There's only one will of God. And it is good, acceptable, and perfect. Too often people try to say that this statement means that there is a perfect will of God, as I was just saying, and a non-perfect will or a permissive will of God. As if it's okay with God to sin. You may be thinking, but that's not necessarily sin. Let's look at that. Okay. James 4.17 said, Therefore to make therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doth it not, to him it is sin. So if I chose not to do what he told me to do, meaning God, I'm sinning. Okay? I've disobeyed, and I know that what he's asked me to do is good for whoever or whatever, and I chose not to, and therefore it is sin. Okay? Romans 14, 23 says, For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Hebrews eleven six, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, back to that perfect will. And I know this is a side note, but it's one of those things that just kind of mm, annoys me. The syntax in Romans 12.2, so the way they're using their punctuations, their commas and so forth, proves to us that it isn't more than one kind of will. It is only one will, okay? Just like if you were given, you were giving us the characteristics of your ideal house and said, oh, it was good, acceptable, and perfect. The words will of God and the house are used as in the same way. You are not talking about two different houses or three different houses when you say that the house that you want is good, acceptable, and perfect. You're talking about one house, okay? Nor is the scripture speaking of two wills of God. It's only talking about one because of where that punctuation is at, where that comma is at. It's these all things are the will of God. Okay, that perfect will of God. There's no imperfect will of God. There's just perfect. God is not imperfect. He's perfect. He's not going to set accept that which is not wholly acceptable and perfect. Okay? What does the Word of God say that we are not to be conformed to or transformed to be like? He said the world. That's right. That's exactly what the Scripture just said. So going back to that Scripture, let me read it to you again. Because I got off on that side note. It says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay. How do we experience transformation? How do we renew that mind? And if you said read the word, excellent. If you said memorize the word, wonderful. If you said pray, great. But there's a key here that a lot of people miss. Because you can study anything. It could be the Bible. It could be how to exercise. It could be um, how to bake a cake. But until you actually exercise, bake that cake, whatever, you haven't transformed. It's just knowledge that is useless until it becomes real by you executing it and you doing it, okay? So that's a very important key there to that transformation. You actually have to do it. You can't just read it. You can't just memorize it. You can't just think it. You can't just pray it. You actually have to do it, okay? All right. How do you prove that, the, that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? Well, let's look at that scripture again. I have some people that I just hear in my heart. They're like, hmm. All right, well, let's look at that. It says, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is it? 
It's the new you. The new you is that perfect will of God. Is you being that new creation. Transformed into being the likeness of Him. As He is, so are you in this world. We must trust in the Lord with all of our heart. And lean not unto our own understanding. And acknowledge Him in all that we do. And He will direct our path. And we can't be wise in our own eyes, but we need to fear the Lord and depart from evil. This is me summarizing Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, or kind of paraphrasing it, but I'll read it. It says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. How are we supposed to trust in the Lord? With all our hearts. So just a little bit? No. All. So what part of all is excluded? If you said none, you're right. All means every last bit, okay? How often are we supposed to acknowledge him or ask him to direct us? All. That's right. All. So, we acknowledge him in all and he will direct all. If we don't acknowledge him, then we're going with our own stinking thinking. Does that mean that every little single thing that you do, you're supposed to ask God? Yes, in a way. Okay? The more you become closer to God, and the more that you die, and it's he that lives and not you, your thinking becomes exactly like his thinking. And it's kind of like a couple who have been together for 50 years. They can finish each other's sentences. Um, they don't even have to talk sometimes and they're communicating because they're seeing things and they know what the other person's reaction will be. I mean, that's like when my, my kids, I have teenagers now, and my kids have always known their whole life that if they had a friend or even met somebody on the road and they wanted to bring them home for dinner, the answer is yes. They don't have to call me because they already know the answer. And the Word of God has his answers to so many things. We don't have to ask him to lay hands on the sick because he's told us to do that. So that that's like asking a parent. If your parent said, um, hey Johnny, you can go get a cookie if you want one. And Johnny says, Mom, can I have a cookie? And it's like, why are you asking me if you can have a cookie when I just said you could have a cookie? You know? So you don't have to ask him what he's already answered. But that's still him directing your path because he's already given you the answer. If you already have the answers to a test, you don't have to look them up. If you already have the answers to a question, you don't have to go find them because you already have the answer. It's the same thing here. So, but that's still acknowledging him because you're giving him supreme authority to be over what you do. Okay? So let's continue on. When we do things our own way and are being wise in our own eyes, Proverbs 3, 7 says, this way of thinking is what? You may remember what I just said. Let me read that to you again on verse 7. Because so often people will quote this scripture and only do verses 5 and 6. But they forget 7, which I think is very important because it's God speaking to us as to what he thinks and feels about the person who directs their own path and does not allow him to direct them. And it says, Be not wise in your own eyes. Depart from evil. Okay, so you're to fear the Lord and depart from evil. So what is he saying to use your own way of thinking to do stuff? He says it's evil. Wow. God says me doing that is evil? Ooh, who ever thought about that before? I remember years ago when I first saw that, and I was like, whoa, wait a minute. That has a whole nother element to this. It's not just whether I give him the option or not. It's me not doing it. He says it's evil. Mm. I don't want the Lord to think I'm evil. I don't know about you, but I know I don't want that idea. Let's continue on. Mm. So, keep in mind. Hold on. Skip too far. Keep in mind that this fight that we are fighting 
is for our very soul of our ourself and our loved ones or anyone else. This fight that we're fighting is for eternity. Even though these attacks come from flesh and blood people, our war isn't in the physical. Okay? God's Word tells us, for, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5. This is a scripture I've done for years. So we got to take that thought captive. We've got to pull down those um, sacred cow thoughts, these things that, these religious thoughts that aren't even backed by scripture. We've got to bring this stuff down and, and cast it down and throw it away so that it's not part of us. And then renew that mind. Anything that we're elevating above God. It needs to be cast down. We cannot be friends with this world. And friends with God. It's not going to happen. God's word tells us again in James 4. 4 know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world. Is the enemy of God. But we can fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. 1 Timothy 6.12 And that thou mightest war a good warfare. Okay? So, we got to stay in the right spot. In the right thinking, which is to be spiritually minded not carnally minded and every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown we the people here but we an incorruptible I therefore so run not as uncertainty so fight I not as one that beateth the air but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection least that by any means when I have preached to others I myself should be a castaway 1 Corinthians 9 25-27 and finally brother be strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand the evil day. And having done all, to stand. And stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take up the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayers and supplication in the Spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplications for all the saints. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. So my dear beloved brothers and sisters, stand firm in the truth. Do not be persuaded to do other. Do not be tempted to do what others are doing, even if it looks like it's fun. Even if the minister of the church that you're attending says that it's okay. If it's contrary to the word, it is not okay. And you need to stand firm, come what may. Because this is a war for your very soul. And my dear friends, do not get distracted. Stand firm. Stand strong. Fight the good fight of faith. And I will see you, if not in the flesh, in heaven. Until next time, you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye now.